So this week, we're going to ask the question, what should we, who have been so incredibly blessed by God in so many ways, what should we do with those rewards? What should we do with that, that prize money, as you could say? Or what should we do with all those blessings that God has poured out on our lives? Well, they just got done singing about it. We should go tell the world. We should share what God has given with us with the world that's around us. Man, I, I got excited watching that video right there. And that's just barely scratching the surface. I'm thankful for a church that loves missions, that loves the very heartbeat of God, that supports 65 missionaries all over the world and over two and a half million dollars has been given in the last 15 years. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? I think that's something worthy of praising God about. I'm thankful for all of the churches that have been started all over the world. I'm thankful for all of the orphanages, the schools, the Bible colleges, the um, Bible clubs. I'm thankful for um, surgical centers. Uh, Matt and Delita, I was just talking to them last night. They, they, they were in the States for about a month and they just got home and I said, did you get settled back in? And they were like, yeah, with a surgical team that's down here working out of that surgical center on their property. Um, they're busy. They're, they're, they're literally being able to offer physical healing, but better than that, spiritual healing. I'm thankful for the hospitals that have been started all around the world, the good that God has been doing, but greater than any of that, the literally thousands of people that have been saved that you and I have been able to be a part of by giving, by just sending people to go where we can't go, by being consumed with getting the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that's in desperate need of it. Um, I, I got to share a few other highlights that didn't make the video, some of my favorites. One of my favorite mission stories that we get to be a part of here at this church has to do with a man by the name of Michael Frederick that we support. Michael Frederick's from Florida, from Panama City, got saved later in life. God got a hold of his heart. God called him to be a missionary in Thailand. So he ends up in Thailand, he plants a church, is pastoring a church over there. Well, a man by the name of Thomas Britton, who is a 22-year-old college graduate, leaves England on holiday. Before he starts off with his life, he's going to go on a year-long holiday. Why, by the way, who would like a year-long holiday? That sounds really nice right now. Anyway, so he, gets, he ends up in Thailand, and he ends up in a, a nightclub, something like that. I don't know what it was exactly, uh, and there is this beautiful woman that's singing and he falls in love instantly and three weeks later he's married to this woman who speaks only Thai and he speaks only English. Now how many of you think that that is not a good recipe to start off in life in a marriage all right? Through a series of circumstances and some unbelievable situations obviously they they got married probably shouldn't have yeah not probably they shouldn't have that that early I mean I don't know how they were even talking or communicating they end up getting married through a series of circumstances. They get saved, and lo and behold, guess whose church they end up in? Michael Frederick's church. Fast forward 15, 20 years, Thomas Britton's life totally gets changed upside down. His wife's life gets totally changed upside down. God lays a burden on his heart to go back home to England, to the city that he grew up in, Market Harbor, and he's sent out of a church that we planted in Thailand, he ends up here. We support him now in England, and God is using missionaries to literally change lives and change people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, does that get you excited? That's an awesome Yeah, praise the Lord for that. That's awesome. Another one um, that I was thinking about this morning is a Christian school that's called South Pacific International Academy and it is in Papua New Guinea, and it was started by missionaries that we have supported for 15, 20 years now, Matt, Allen, and his wife, Becky. We also support their mom and dad. I wish I could, we could just take a whole Sunday and talk about what God's done in Papua New Guinea. It's been absolutely incredible. But one of the things they've been able to do recently is start a Christian school in Port Moresby, which is the capital city of Papua New Guinea. And I saw Matt earlier in this year. He was um, here in the States at Pensacola Christian College recruiting teachers to go teach in this school, which teaches all English, which teaches the Abeka curriculum, which is a biblically-based, Christ-centered curriculum. And Matt told me while we were talking, he said, Mike, it would not surprise me if one of the future presidents of the country of Papua New Guinea was currently enrolled in our school. Some of the most influential leaders in an entire nation are sending their children to a school that has been started by a missionary that's teaching not just English, but that's teaching a biblical worldview 
Does that not get you excited? Just thinking about the power of the gospel and what God can do through missions. And then last but not least, I could go on all day. We could spend the entire morning talking about this, but the India project. Remember, we introduced that video. We, we, you all, as of today, we have currently given a little bit over 40% of our goal already. And tomorrow we are sending a total of $50,000 over to India. We're sending 35,000 from our church, which is just a couple thousand more than we've given to this point. And then another church is sending another $20,000. And they're gonna begin to build the third story of that. So by the time they start their new term in June, they're gonna be able to add more students who are being trained to go plant and start churches in some of the most difficult, closed countries in all of the world, places that you and I could never get into. But because we support missions and because we give sacrificially, men and women are being chained to take the gospel to literally some of the most remote parts of the earth where it's illegal to preach the gospel and people are gonna be saved and lives are going to be transformed. Will you praise the Lord this morning for what God's doing? all over the world. And it's all because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And it all goes back to the motivation that should be in the hearts of every single one of us. Man, I, I don't know about you, but when we think about the goodness of God, it ought to explode out of us where we want to do everything we can in and of our power to reach as many people as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Romans 5 ties perfectly in with this. The title of the message this morning is this, Go Tell the World. And in our passage that we're going to conclude, we're going to go with the second part of the argument that Paul started last week. In this passage, Paul wants to push our thinking deeper. I'm glad we're in a passage like this on the night after an extra hour of sleep because we need to be alert and paying attention because Paul's trying to stretch our thinking. He wants us to understand the basis. He doesn't want us just to go around and, and talk about Yes, we are so blessed, but he really wants us to understand the foundation of our blessings. So that way, they never get old. It's not something that's frivolous that when a storm comes up, it blows us off those moors. No, he wants us to think deeply and carefully about how blessed we are. And he's going to do it through a comparison contrast. Because of one man, Adam, who sinned, death passed upon all men. Because of one man, Jesus who lived a righteous life and went to a cross and died, all men can be saved. All men can experience the righteousness of Jesus Christ. On the surface, for some people, that sounds pretty simple and easy to take in and understand. For really inquisitive people who question everything, they might go a little deeper and say, how is that even possible? How, how am I guilty because of one man? How can I be righteous because of one man? Paul covers all of those bases. And in this passage, he's not only going to answer some big questions, he's also going to tell us why this matters. And as a result, the answers are not supposed to just make us feel good about who we are in Christ, but they ought to motivate us to go tell the world about Jesus. So who's ready to dive right in? There we go. Okay, let's dive right in. All right, here's the first point. Go tell the world. The first thing that we have to understand is death dominates. First point is very sobering. Death dominates. Look at verse 12. It says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Right off the bat, we have a huge theological principle that's being taught here. The whole human race is related to one human head, and that human head is Adam. Adam was the first man. And when he sinned in the garden, the punishment for sin, which was death, it didn't just affect Adam, it affected the entire human race. The damage done by Adam's sin affects every human being in every place, in every single time. Now, this is a concept that even children understand. I had a mom come up to me the other night after church on Wednesday and it just happened to be the morning after Halloween. And she told me a funny story about her child that morning who woke up and she, she had to get him out of bed early and he didn't want to get up and he didn't want to go to school. And she heard him in the room while she was getting ready saying, dumb Adam, dumb Eve, dumb Apple. Why do we have to get up? Why do we have to go to work? Now we laugh at that, but how many of you have been there before? 
Anybody just like got really mad at Adam one day and said, how could you have done this to us? I mean, on a basic level, we understand this. Even kids are able to grasp and understand this concept. What Paul's teaching right off the bat, what we have to understand when we're talking about death dominates, we lost before we even started. We lost before we even started. We aren't born righteous. And then if and when we sin, we lose our righteousness. That's not how it works. We're not born perfect. We're not born good. The Bible tells us the exact opposite. We are born in our we are born dead in our trespasses and sins. And yet, what is a very prevalent philosophy that's out there in our world today? If I live a good enough life, and if my good outweighs my bad in the end, I don't see that there's any way that God's not going to let me into heaven. And the Bible tells us an exact opposite story. There is none good. There is none righteous. No, not one. We are born dead in our trespasses and sins. Going through life and trying to prove your righteousness is like trying to beat a casino. Alana and I were in Las Vegas a week ago. From the time you step off the airplane into the airport, you are met by slot machines everywhere you go. Now, I don't know about you. If you've ever been to Las Vegas, and if you've ever been on the Strip, and if you've ever been inside of one of those casinos, they're incredible. They absolutely are. They are elaborate. They are ornate. They are their, uh, their own world to itself. I mean, you could get lost inside of just one single casino and they are lined up down the strip one after another. Anything that you want to experience in this world right there at your fingertips. And I don't know about you, but that ought to tell us something that that's your money. Not my money. I've never done that. Okay. That's somebody's money that's building that, okay? You, you lose before you even started. And on a basic level, we all know that. I, I Googled it for fun. I said, um, how much money does a Las Vegas casino make? And the very first response that came up was so good. The very first caption was this, Sin City always wins. I mean, think about that from a spiritual aspect too, by the way. Sin City Always wins. A Las Vegas casino can make anywhere from, on average, from $1 million to $10 million per day. We're not winning. (laughs) Now, Satan is good. He throws out enough, he throws out enough gifts. He throws out enough things to lure us in, enough prize money to tempt us and to keep us coming back for more. Just this morning, I was looking at a news news app and I saw on there that a man at the Excalibur Casino in Las Vegas won $12.2 million off a slot machine. And we're talking about, this was on WEAR's website, okay? In Florida, that's gonna suck people in. When you walk by a slot machine, you're gonna think, oh, I can put in $5, $10 and I might strike it rich. And you know what? Every now and then you might land on getting a little bit more than you put out but in the end who wins and who wins every single time and that's the reality you can spend the rest of your life trying to prove how righteous and how good you are but in the end we are broken and we know that we are sinners and we know that our righteousness amounts to nothing but filthy rags before a holy and righteous God death dominates now Paul doesn't finish the sentence that he starts in verse 12. If you notice at the end of verse 12, you'll see a colon. And he's not going to pick this sentence back up until he gets to verse 18. So before he just moves off of this, we might think, oh, we've we've covered this point. We've got that down. Paul's like, no, no, no. We need to dig in a little bit deeper. We need to go a little further, make sure we fully grasp what we're talking about here. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Paul answers a question that he anticipates people asking. And here's the question. How can somebody be guilty of breaking a law that they didn't know was a law? It's a fair question, right? Can you be guilty of breaking a law that's not even written necessarily or that you don't even know what it is? How can we be guilty? How can we be losing before we even get started? How can we be born into this world broken? That's even a bigger question that's that's at stake here. And so he asks that question. He gets us thinking. And then in verse 14, he answers it. He says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. He's pointing out here, obviously, when Moses came, the law came, God's law came, which made it very clear what you had to do in order to have a relationship with Jesus and to have a relationship with God. 
And Paul's saying here that obviously from Adam to Moses, people died. So that means that sin was in the world. Well, look where he goes on and how he continues in that verse. So nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay, sin was in this world. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. What he's saying here is that death is not first and foremost about our own sinning against God's law, but about what happened in Adam. Okay, again, the main point here is you lost before you even started. We don't even get a chance to prove our righteousness. We don't even get a chance to show if we can live up to the standards of the law because Adam already sinned and Adam already messed up. And because he sinned and because he messed up, we are automatically sinners and we are automatically born dead in our trespasses and sins. He's driving this point home. And he says it even by saying, even after the similitude of Adam's transgression um, or even over them that had not sinned after the similitude. You know who he's talking about here? I believe he's talking about children. I believe he's talking about babies, infants. Because death dominates in our world, because the punishment for sin was death, sometimes the unfortunate reality is that even children die, even babies die, even infants die. There are people that die before they have even the ability to comprehend the difference between right and wrong because uh, even before they can even understand what is at stake. And by the way, I believe that God is merciful and gracious in this. I believe the Bible tells us clearly that before, that when a child dies, David talked about he lost a son and he said he would see him again in heaven one day. I believe that, that God's righteousness covers those children as well. But the point is, death dominates. And it even dominates over those who did not ever have a chance to prove their own righteousness or not. And what he's trying to drive home is the judicial consequences of Adam's sin are experienced by all people. And as a result, death dominates. The reason why I saw that about the casino this morning is because I opened up the app to see what some of the leading headlines were today. Of course, you cannot turn on the news without talking about, without seeing news about the war that's happening in Israel and the thousands of people that have died and have lost their lives. Um, Some other things that came up, strong earthquake hits Nepal, killing at least 157 people. Um, Locally, there's a police officer killed in a fatal shooting, a cleared in a fatal shooting. Um, There was something about the Matthew Perry Foundation, a celebrity from Friends that that died unexpectedly in his early 50s. Um, There's also something about the college basketball legend Bobby Knight that had died and passed away earlier this week. Um, There was another headline about a Milton man who was charged with trying to run over his neighbor. Wasn't successful, but that's the city we live in. Milton, Florida, you better be nice to your neighbors. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think the Bible tells us a very good principle to follow. And then uh, there's another one about a Cincinnati woman um, who just celebrated her 108th birthday. And we're talking about life, but what we're really talking about is the fact that she's defying death at 108 years of age. Do you understand? I think we all get the point, right? Death dominates in our world. And here's the practical application before we move on. Number your days. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 12. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. Psalm 90, verse 12. Let's all read this out loud together. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The Bible tells us to live soberly, to live with the seriousness in our lives. Because we don't, we're, no one here is promised a tomorrow. The Bible tells us that our life is a vapor. It appears for a time and vanishes away. Just like that, everything can come to an end. And God does not want us to live in fear. He's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And what a sound mind does is puts their faith and trust in Jesus and realizes that ultimately death doesn't have the final say so, that it's going to be okay. And we number our days and we live in a way that is very purposeful. We live in a way that follows the commission that he gave us before he went into heaven. Go tell the world about me. I love the way that that song, um, what it said in the second verse of that song, where I go, you will go to someday. Are you looking forward to heaven? (laughs) But there's much to do here before you leave. God's got a work for us to do here before we leave. Some of the ways that you can number your days, and there's all kinds of practical applications, but since this is a missions emphasis Sunday, 
you know what we can do? We can give. Giving puts a governor on our spending. Giving helps us to put life into perspective and help us to make choices of what really matters in life. And you know what? With faith promise, it causes us to just stop and take some time and examine our priorities and where they're at in life. And if we want to be a part of the amazing things that God's doing all over the world, we can give towards that. God allows us to. And God wants us to give selflessly and sacrificially. And all we ask you to do as a church is just to talk to God, to pray about an amount that he would lay on your heart that he would have you to give, and then just give it. And I know that if we do that, we can meet the needs that God wants us to meet and we can send the missionaries and we can support reaching the world in the way that God wants us to if we all are just individually obedient to what God tells us to do and what he lays on our heart. Now, I'm burdened about this even in the sense of, I'll just be transparent and honest with you. God's been blessing our ministry in incredible ways and everything has increased and everything has grown. But guess what? Missions has stayed kind of stagnant in our church for the past five to seven years. And we've been given right at somewhere between 130 to $150,000. I would love to see that increase. We've experienced unprecedented growth. I would love to see that number go up. Our goal this year is $175,000. With $175,000, we can give all the money that we have committed to the India Project, and we can support all 65 of those missionaries all over the world, and that's only a $25,000 increase over where we're at today. And all the point is that I'm trying to make is with all that God's done and with the reality that this world is in desperate need of the hope of Jesus Christ, We can be obedient and we can give. At the end of our service, you're going to have a chance to fill this out and you can come down and you can just commit to continue to giving what you are. You can start giving towards missions or you can increase that amount. We do this quarterly just to remind us, to motivate us that there are people all over the world that we get to be a part of with reaching them with the gospel. And one other thing we can do is we can pray. Something we haven't done in years here, and we're going to do it again today at the end of the service. You can adopt a missionary for your family. My brother Dan was here a few weeks ago, and he's a missionary in Madagascar, and he mentioned on that day that he would rather have a thousand churches that pray for them than a thousand churches that give towards them. And the reality is, money's not an option with God. God provides for his work. Of course, he does it through us, and we get to be a part of what he's doing. But prayer is what ultimately makes a difference. And so we're going to give you and your family an opportunity to come down at the end of the service, pick one of these envelopes up. Inside of these envelopes is a missionary family that our church already supports, and you and your family can adopt them. And you, this, this will give you a letter that will tell you how you can communicate with them, some conversation starters, how you can be a blessing to them. And throughout this next year, you and your family can get to know one of our missionaries intimately. And by the way, if all of these envelopes are taken, then all 65 missionaries are being prayed for and they're being known intimately by people that are in our church and we can be a part of what God is doing all around the world. And the point is, just number your days. Man, what better thing to teach your kids about than people who are willing to take their lives and use them for the cause of Christ because he's worth living for and he's worth dying for and he's worth giving towards and he's worth all of our hearts and soul and mind and our strength. So number your days. Secondly, Not only does death dominate, are you ready for some more positive news here? Jesus obliterates. Jesus obliterates. He utterly destroys. He wipes out. We get a setup that's coming at the end of verse 14. At the end of verse 14, there's a little phrase. It says, who is the figure of him that was to come? As soon as we clearly see that our sin nature goes back to Adam disobeying God, we can then see the parallel to Christ. All right, just like we are all related to Adam in his sin, we can all be related to Christ in his righteousness because Adam sinned and we're guilty because Jesus was righteous. We can be righteous. That's the point of what he's talking about. But then look at how he starts verse 15. He says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. And essentially what he's saying right there, the free gift is not like the offense. Okay, there's a comparison. Adam was the first man. Jesus was the last Adam. There's a comparison. They were both men, and they're both representatives of the entire human race. But the free gift is nothing like the offense. I brought something to help us understand this in this bag right here. I've got some mini frosted chocolate-covered donuts. Any of you like these little Debbie donuts right here? 
Okay, there's some hands going up. If you know anything about our family, you know that these are everywhere at Christmas. Anytime our family gets together, my dad goes and buys these or the Entenmann's donuts. And quite frankly, I'm just going to be honest with you. These things are not good. These are cheap. They're covered in a wax like chocolate. Let's be real here. And whatever's inside of that is pretty crunchy and stale. All right. But I still can't walk by one of these because it's nostalgia. It brings me back to my childhood. This is my whole life right here. I love these little guys, especially the chocolate ones. They're way better than the white powdered ones, okay? So we got donuts right here. Oh, but look at, what if I pick up this box and I bring this one out right here? It's exactly what I was hoping for. I don't even know. Oh, inside of here, I have a dozen fresh out of the fryer, not the oven. Fresh out of the fryer this morning, I stopped by Milton Bakery. I basically had that place all to myself this morning. I got 12 chocolate-covered glazed donuts in here, which I, I'll argue, I'll fight you about this. I believe these are the best donuts in the entire world. Now, how many of you believe that I have chocolate-covered donuts and chocolate-covered donuts? I thought about taking them out and eating one in front of you, but I didn't want to torture you all like that this morning. But how many of you agree that what's in here is nothing like what's in here. Yeah, some of you raised your hands, some of you are nodding your heads. They're the same, but they're not the same at all. And that's the point of where we are going. Yes, Adam is our representative in sin, and Jesus is our representative in righteousness. And they're both men, and they are both the head of the human race in one area or not. But there is something completely and fundamentally different about the righteousness of Jesus Christ than the sin nature that we have in Adam. And so what this point is under here, it's shock and awe. What we're about to go through here is shock and awe. If you know anything about that term, it's a military term. Overwhelming power and spectacular displays. That's what shock and awe is all about. So in these verses, you know what we have? First thing we have is shock and awe. God's grace is certain. Look at what he says in verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, everybody, what are those next two words out loud together? Much more, let's say that again, much more the grace of God. When he's talking about more here, he's not talking about quantity. He's talking about certainty. If you are certain that because of Adam, we are all sinners, which all you got to do is open up your eyes and look around the world and you will know. Look inside. We know we're broken. We know that death dominates. And if we're certain that because of Adam, we are all sinners, then you can be much more certain that the grace of God that is available through Jesus Christ is available to you in your life. I got a question before we move on. Is God fair? Is God fair? I think we have to ask this as we're going about this. Is it fair that I've lost before I've even started? Is it fair that I'm not born with the same chance that Adam was given when he was created? Can I just tell you that God in his sovereignty, he knows all things and he does all things well. And if the prototype of all humanity was perfect and placed in a perfect environment with only one temptation and he's still messed up, I guarantee you that every single one of us in here would also mess up as well. Instead of getting mad at God and questioning God for the fact that death reigns and death dominates in this world, how about the fact of God's genius and the fact that because of one man's sin, all die, but because of one man's righteousness, we can all be saved? How about the goodness of God that is seen in his divine design of how he puts this all together? How about the shock and awe that God's gift abounds to many? Look at the very end of verse 15. He says, for if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, everybody read those last four words out loud with me, hath abounded unto many, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, the gift by grace, and it hath abounded to many. The gift of God's grace is available to any and all who will receive it, any and all who will believe it. And can I tell you this morning that judgment is not God's ultimate goal for the universe. 
Man, again, instead of questioning God and why is he allowed sin and why is he allowed death? Hey, it was our decision. It was our fault. It's our rebellion against God. And in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that we deserve every bit of the punishment that we should get, we don't have to take it because judgment is not God's ultimate goal for the universe. His glorious grace is. He's provided a way of escape that's available to all who put their faith and trust in him. His gift abounds to many. It gets better. Verse 16, shock and awe. God's gift obliterates all sin. It wipes out all sin. Look at verse 16. It says, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of everybody, those two words out loud, many offenses unto justification. It makes perfect sense that one sin would deserve the punishment and the judgment that it gets. Let's go all the way back to the garden. God was very clear. Adam, in the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's absolutely understandable that what was spelled out clearly, if there's a rule and a law that is given and you violate that rule or the law, you deserve judgment and you deserve the punishment that you get as a result. That's something that is understandable. (laughs) Oh, are you ready for this? The gift is not like the sin. If one sin called for condemnation, then many sins should call for a greater condemnation, right? One sin deserves condemnation. Many sins deserves all the condemnation, all the wrath, all the judgment of God that you could possibly imagine. But nope, that's not what this verse teaches. The free gift is of many offenses, a large but indefinite indefinite number. So what that means is no matter how great your sins, no matter how many your past sins, God's Grace is greater, and his grace and his righteousness completely obliterates all sin, many offenses. He doesn't put a number on it because the number is infinite, and it's endless, and it doesn't matter who sins and how great you sin. God's grace is great enough to forgive every bit of that sin. And then last but not least, my favorite, shock and awe, you reign over sin. Look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense... Death reigned by one. What are those next two words? Much more. They which receive. What are those next three words? Abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. By one man's sin, condemnation came. By one man's righteousness. He says much more, by the way. Okay, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. What this verse is teaching is that God's grace delivers us from the rule of death so radically as to enable us to change places with it, to reign over it, to dominate it. Instead of death dominating, the grace and the righteousness of God dominates. We just got done with our men's retreat this past weekend. You may see a lot of our men wearing those um, it's personal shirts from the challenge that we had. One of the things, what do you do when you get a bunch of guys together at 11 o'clock at night when there's a curfew? You whip mattresses out of the rooms and you have a big wrestling match. Wasn't quite as good as last year. Last year, man, the hype was a lot better, a lot more action. But this year, we still did it. It was mostly teenagers out there wrestling. We were having a great time. All the dads were in there. All the waivers were signed. Don't worry about any of that. What could possibly go wrong, right? Anyway, so we're in there wrestling. And what's interesting is get a bunch of guys. It's late at night. There's a lot of excitement. And when someone is dominating the other person, when they throw them down and they're on top and they're in a dominating position, when the person on the bottom is able to escape and the roles are completely reversed, that's when everybody erupts and it's like, oh, yeah. That's exactly what happened on the cross. Death had us pinned. Death has us dead to rights. We've lost. There's no way out. And then the gift of God's grace comes and it enables us to reverse the roles. And now we're on top and we're in the dominating position and we can conquer everything that life throws our way, not because of us, but because of who Jesus is. That's the truth of what we're talking about here. So the practical application, reign in this life. Reign in this life. Hamish gave a perfect testimony and had no idea where we were going with this. Obliterate despair. We beat ourselves up. 
Because of our sins. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. He wants you to wake up today and he wants you to forget that God's mercies are new and fresh every morning. And he wants us to live in our failures and in our faults. And he wants us to believe that we'll never amount to anything and that we can't conquer whatever the vice is that God has in our, that the grip that Satan has in our life. And he wants us to believe that that's gonna stay that way forever. But the Bible tells us the exact opposite. No, the Bible says because of the gift of grace that abounds to many, we've changed places with it and re reign over it. And the best thing that we can do is we can look Satan in the eye and say, you're right, I am a sinner and I don't deserve God's grace, but I have it. And my God and Savior Jesus Christ is greater and bigger and stronger. And I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. And get up and live in that and reign over your sin. Man, one of the challenges we heard yesterday, God can turn it around. He absolutely can. Your situation is not impossible. Your demons that you deal with in your personal life, they are not greater than the grace of God. They are not greater than a conquering, resurrecting power that raises from the dead. You want to find hope in the gospel? Look directly at Jesus Christ and look at the power of God that lives inside of you. And look at that situation and say, by God's grace and for God's glory, I'm going to get up and I'm going to live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to see God deliver me a victory. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. He obliterates. Oh, he doesn't just dominate. He obliterates the competition because that's who our God and Savior is. And it all ends with this. Death dominates. Jesus obliterates. Grace liberates. He gets back to 18 and 19 and he sums it all up. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment, of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. There's a couple things I want you to see in here. The one act, one great act of sin equals death for all men. One great act of righteousness in Jesus Christ equals not just life, abundant, eternal life for all men. But more importantly, I want you to know the many that are affected. The many in Adam and the many in Christ are not the same group. All you got to do to be in Adam is to be born into this world. Because when you're born into this world, you're born into Adam. You are born dead in your trespasses and sins. And just because Jesus Christ came and went to a cross and died on that cross for our sins doesn't automatically mean that we're saved just by default. It's to as many as receive the gift of righteousness. It's a free gift, but in order for the gift to be yours, you have to take the gift. You have to accept the gift. And the best way that I can possibly say this is if you want the grace of God to liberate you in your life, you must be born again. There's not a better analogy than that. You must be born again. You were born physically in Adam. And as a result, you inherit all that Adam gave us, which was our sin nature. But in order to experience and inherit all of the righteousness of Jesus, you've got to be born in Jesus Christ. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, he said, am I supposed to go back into the womb and be born of my mother again? And he says, no, that's not it at all. It's by faith. It's by faith. I believe with all my heart, you've got to be able to look back to a specific point in time in your life where everything clicked and made sense. I say that every week in our invitation. Because we don't just, because we have this head knowledge, we don't just all of a sudden become saved. No, it requires repentance. It requires believing. We gotta be able to look back at a time where I'm a sinner and I've been headed my own direction away from God, but now I realize what the cross is all about and I realize what Jesus did on that cross and I'm repenting, I'm believing. I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I'm not going my own way. I'm not going my, living my own way. I'm gonna put my faith in Jesus and I'm gonna pursue him above everything else. It's because he died that I can live. It's because of his righteousness that I can become righteous. And when you put your faith in him in that way, you're born again. It's not a prayer that saves you. It's not baptism that saves you. It's not the church that you go to that saves you. It's not the family that you were born into that saves you. It is that moment of believing in your own heart and your own life that Jesus is your savior that saves you. You must be born again. In a minute, we're gonna give you a chance to respond to that. You can respond to that right now. If you believe that in your heart, 
you say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm headed my own way and I believe in you and only you to be saved right now in your seat, you can be saved. You, that's all that it is. It's a belief. It's a turning point. But the last thing that I want to challenge our church with is this. Love righteously. Love righteously. Look at verse 20. Last practical application. It says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. You know why the law was given? So that we would know just how dreadfully sinful we are. That's what it says. The whole reason why God gave us the law is so that we would know that we're sinners. And that we're imperfect and that there's none righteous, no, not one. The law was given to increase the offense. One of the dangers that we face as Christians is we can become hyper aware of the sin in the world to the point that we can become condemning, and critical, hateful, even sometimes, I think. I think even Christians, there's sometimes we get hateful attitudes towards people in this world that do things that we consider to be unrighteous and we might not even consider it, the Bible considers it to be unrighteous. I'm not trying to minimize that there's, there, are, there is sin, there is evil, there is wickedness in our world today. It is prevalent, it is everywhere. And I think we should hate evil and we should hate sin and we should hate the consequences of it, but not the people themselves. Because you know what that verse ends with? Everybody look at it, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Our position as believers in Jesus is not to look at the world with a condemning, critical eye saying, how could it be so wicked? And how can these people get away with it? And man, they deserve every bit of punishment that they get. Do you understand? You and I deserve every bit of punishment that we can get. And that's not the way that God's in heaven looking at this world. No, missions is the very heartbeat of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right now, death dominates, but grace can reign in this life. If you and I as God's children adopt the same heart that God has and we look at this world with compassion and we look at this world with, we look at this world with the same heart and mindset that God looks at it, and we look out and we say, yeah, it's awful. It is wicked. It is corrupt. I'm raising kids in this world. And one of my kids was asking me yesterday, we were talking, he's like, we were talking about the draft. And he's like, I think in five years I might be drafted into war. And at first I wanted to kind of laugh at that. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. It could happen, honestly. I don't know what the days ahead hold. We live in a corrupt, messed up world, right? But where sin abounds... Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It is not hopeless. We are living in the days of the gospel. We are living in the days where we have the power of God and his righteousness that can turn everything upside down and put it on its head. And that's what we need to believe in. And that's what we need to carry into this world. Loving righteously is not having that condemning spirit and going into our bunkers and just waiting for it all to come to an end. No, it is charging victoriously and courageously into a dark world with the light of Jesus Christ and pointing people to the hope that there is in him, defying all the odds and living in a way where others look and say, man, that's a person that's living for the cause of Christ. Go tell the world, you got a powerful gospel and a powerful savior that reigns and rules inside of your life. Don't let Satan have the final word.